So welcome everybody to another edition of our monthly uh, Alaska Photographic Center meeting, our APC uh, lecture series. And, um, you know, we usually, we used to traditionally meet on a Tuesday night, but because of certain scheduling, we're on Wednesdays uh, for the next two months at least. Um, I will, I'm going to read a few announcements before I get to introducing Jason, but um, uh, next month we have Hal Gage and uh, Hal has a show which I think is open right now at um, Bunnell Street Gallery in Homer and uh, it's, it's a glacial silt images and if you know Hal's work, um, they're, they're probably abstracted in, in, in some way. Um, I hear it's a really strong show and I can't wait to hear him speak about it. So he's gonna, um, he's gonna talk to APC on Wednesday, November 18th at 7 p.m. And uh, it'll be a Zoom lecture just like this one. So um, you'll be able to access the link through uh, the APC website um, or through an email blast. Um, we're also having a Zoom holiday party on December 16th at 7 p.m. So there's your chance for the, the drinking Zoom sessions. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out um, for that Zoom link um, to participate December 16th at 7. Um, uh, December 4th, we're having a rarefied light. That's the L-I-T-E version. 2020 virtual opening at APU, Alaska Pacific University. Um, that's December 4th at 5 p.m. And the APU um, curator, Melissa Shaganoff, will be moderating. And I'm not sure yet what the format is, um, but, um, but that should be a good, good one. We really had a great um, talk uh, when was that a month ago with Richard Murphy and De Kahin and uh, Kate Wool talking about rarefied light and and uh, I can't wait to get the the recording of that and and show it to my students. So because um, you guys it was really, really great breakdown of of Alaska photography. So um, <clears throat> last announcement is uh, look out for rarefied light 2021 and um, we'll be having Eddie Soloway. Um, of course, that's always dependent on COVID situations, whether what kind of events that will be, but just stay tuned. Um, Eddie Soloway has been in Alaska uh, several times and is a, an amazing outdoor nature photographer, landscape. A lot of his stuff is really abstract. Um, and he's just a, a, a incredibly sweet, guy, just a giving individual. So can't wait to, to get that, um, get him up back up here. So um, tonight we have uh, Fairbanks photographer J. Jason Lazarus. Um, Jason has taught at UAF for 15 years and he teaches a wide range of processes from traditional darkroom work, alternative processes and digital. Um, he's a board member on APC for us. He does a lot of work in social media and other programming. And he's also the chair of the Society of Photographic Educators uh, Northwest chapter. And, and they had a great conference up at UAF campus uh, last, uh, well, I don't know when that was, a year ago summer, I guess it was, summer 2019. Um, so um, for the past five years, Jason's been working on a se series, a, a digital pho photographic series on Alaskan landscapes in the wintertime entitled Resilient. Um, it's on display right now at the Fairbanks Art Association Bear Gallery and, uh, till the end of the month. And uh, Jason's, this series, or I think photographs from the series have been shown in various gallery shows around the country and um, specifically in uh, Rarified Light 2019, one of the lead images, one of my favorite images from his, his, of his work, uh, won Best of Show. 
in rarefied light. So, um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason, and and we can hear um, from him about his work. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciate that intro. Let me hand over hosting duties. Uh, for those of you that attended last time, this is going to work a lot smoother because we have co-hosts now, so I'm not trying to do everything at the same time. Um, one of the things I want to end up doing tonight is providing a, a brief tour of the space here at, at uh, the, sorry, I'm trying to run another Zoom at the same time. Um, because I'm gonna use my phone so that we can walk around. So I'll have to start that up again really quick. Uh, but uh, Fairbanks Arts has been so gracious to allow me to utilize their space after hours and provide a kind of virtual tour of this work. Uh, when a lot of people at this time of year, this particular year, 2020, as it has been, uh, a lot of us are staying home and staying away from the arts community, and we need to, we definitely need that to to subsist. It's it's part of of who we are as photographers and artists, and and we need to see art. And so I'm trying to uh, do something a little bit different and uh, provide people access to the space, especially seeing that I'm noticing uh, a lot of names that I recognize from the lower 48 that have chimed in. So thank you for all of you that are, are tuning in much later than, than the folks in, in Fairbanks and Anchorage. So I really appreciate that. But before we start, um, let me go ahead and, and uh, share my screen here. Let's see. Actually, let's stop that share really quickly. We'll get there. Stop. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to this this uh, APC Wednesday Photo Wednesday talk. Uh, before I begin, I want to briefly start by acknowledging that I live in Fairbanks, which is on the ancestral territory of the Lower Tanana Dene or Athabascan peoples. The university that I teach at is situated on Troth Yetta the indigenous and recognized name for the ridge that the campus sits upon. In fact, our interior Alaska campus is now referred to as the Troth Yetta campus. I acknowledge this not only in thanks to the indigenous communities who have held relationship with this land for generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. May we nurture our relationship with our Diné neighbors, and our shared responsibilities to their homeland where we now reside together. Uh, before I start, I really do want to thank both, both APC as well as uh, Fairbanks Arts Association for this opportunity to bring not only my work to you, but, but discussing this work and, and making it an, a larger conversation about photography, uh, how I approach photography, and uh, what I think it's, it is important about the creative process of, of creating with a camera and, and uh, seeing the world around you in a different way. And so before I, I talk too much about this, I, I want to talk about the state of, of um, art, uh, the art community in Alaska, as well as all of these nonprofits and how much, as much as everyone else is struggling during this, this coronavirus season, uh, these nonprofits are struggling as well, uh, uh, both APC and, and Fairbanks Arts had to end up giving up one of their largest sources of revenue when it came to to memberships this year to uh, because of the realities of, of dealing with a more virtual uh, exhibit and having to cancel in person exhibits and so because of that I really do want to encourage all of you to think back and see whether or not this was the time of year that you generally re-upped your membership or donated to these organizations because uh, they're struggling just like uh, all of us are during this time and I'd encourage you to to truly consider becoming either a member of 
of APC. Uh, I'm, I'm showing their website right now uh, at akphotocenter.org. Uh, and for $25 a year, this provides you uh, amazing access to a lot of opportunities, especially when it comes to rarefied light uh, and, and that touring exhibit throughout the entire state is an amazing opportunity. You get discounts for, for a variety of different APC-based workshops uh, and email blasts and, and that community that we're building with these these uh, nonprofits are essential to not only our lives as artists and photographers, but also just essential to building up uh, friendship and camaraderie in our community. So I did really encourage you to consider becoming a member uh, a as well of, of Fairbanks Arts Association. Uh, I re-up every single year during, during their 64th parallel show. And in fact, this year, because of the backlog of shows canceled because of a variety of different reasons, uh, my show ended up taking up the space that that 64th parallel generally does. And so because of that, they lost a lot of potential revenue from, from membership re-ups uh, from that community driven show. So I'd really encourage you to, to invest in the amazing work that Fairbanks Arts Association does as well. And you'll be able to tour the, the uh, exhibit here in just a, a, a minute. I'm going to really quickly break to uh, get myself on my phone now so that I can provide a, a brief tour uh, after I stop my share. So. Uh, I'm gonna walk around my laptop now. So that'll settle it. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm gonna disconnect here and walk you around the space, provide you a bit of a, a tour of the Fairbanks uh, Arts Association Gallery here. They have a pretty spacious uh, gallery space. I, I'm sharing the space right now with Jesse Hedden, which has a bunch of assemblage and, and painting work in, in the uh, space right next to me. But let's go ahead and, and provide you a bit of a tour of my exhibit. So. <clears throat> so each of these images, uh, the entire series is, is focused on Alaskan landscapes and each of the images are kind of non-traditional landscape images because they're, they're square. Uh, specifically, I photograph them as uh, squares to kind of focus on the formal elements when it comes to these images, uh, focus on the formal relationships between the various shapes uh, in, in each of the images. Mike mentioned this particular image uh, earlier. This is the uh, Absent Lake with Captive Conifer, and this was uh, 2019 Rarified Lights Best in Show, uh, jur juried by Bob Sacha. I'll end up showing each of these images uh, on, on my screen as, as, uh, as a presentation here uh, just in a couple minutes. Specifically, I'm really geared toward photographing the landscape in uh, a way that emphasizes not just those formal elements, but really speaks to uh, the nature of the true nature of, of winter in Alaska. And particularly, I think that it's unfortunate that most, most fine art photographers uh, outside of Alaska that come up tend to photograph Alaska in its prime. Uh, when, when the sun's shining, when the snow's away, when everything's in bloom. And uh, in, in my estimation, a lot of photographers uh, are attempting to replicate the beauty and the awe that we see in a lot of Ansel Adams's work. And uh, 
I don't know how many people are going to throw tomatoes at me for saying this, but Ansel Adams has never really truly inspired me with his images. And I think it's because he's so well known uh, and, and so uh, synonymous with landscape photography. As an instructor at UAF, I tend to hear people uh, that don't know any artists out there, any photographic artists, they have experience with Ansel Adams. Uh, if they're interested in uh, landscape photography, they immediately gravitate toward Ansel Adams uh, because it's such a big rock star name. And so uh, I actually avoided landscape for a lot of uh, my, my first bit of my career as a photographer because uh, I just felt like I was going to be um, copying everyone else or aspiring to be a, a mini Ansel Adams. And, and for years, I, I really wanted to avoid that. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll expand on those concepts here in, in just a couple minutes, but we're, we're at the end of the tour here uh, of the space. I have 22 images on display. Uh, they'll be on display until the 30th, uh, so the end of the month here. Uh, so please, if, if you feel inclined, drop by the gallery. They're open uh, 12 to six, uh, Monday through Fridays. So, uh, let's let's talk about this a little bit more now that I'm not moving around and trying to get everything to work. Uh, let me share my desktop again. And so let me provide a bit more of an introduction to um, to who I am. Um, like Mike said, I've been teaching photography at UAF uh, since 2005 when I started teaching my first darkroom courses there. So I teach a, a wide variety of, of both analog and digital photography courses. One of the things that's really a, a big passion for me is alternative and historical photographic processes. A lot of that comes out of a, a desire for my, my final image to be uh, visibly different than what you're getting out of a digital uh, printer. Now, of course, any any photographer worth their stuff can tell the difference between a, a digital image and an analog produced image. But on the other hand, most customers can't. Most people buying the your artwork don't recognize the effort that you're putting forth in the darkroom. And I felt like I was spending so much time in the darkroom that that I really want to keep that that experience, that hands on, that tangible element of my image to be part of uh, what I was selling people, what I was giving people. Uh, so I created this with my hands. And so that's why uh, those, those handmade uh, objects and handmade processes really, really engage me. Um, I'm an avid film photographer. I tend to walk around uh, every day with a at least a rolly tee in my in my bag, or uh, I'll have my rolly tee and my Mamiya Seven with me at all times. I also do shoot digitally. Uh, most of what I shoot digitally is from a Fujifilm X100F with a fixed lens, 23 millimeter lens. And in fact, this entire series has been shot with that, that series of cameras. I don't use long lenses. Uh, I've just never been that kind of photographer. Um, I don't like having a bunch of choices when it comes to, well, I can use that lens or this lens or this lens. Uh, I would much rather consider the, the final result of the image that I'm producing. So if I want a, a, to elicit a certain feeling or an emotion, maybe uh, infrared film would work better. So I'll take that camera out or uh, there's a, a small, um, kind of art house uh, film producer called Film Washi that actually makes film on washi paper. Uh, and I've shot 
a couple rolls of that and it creates a very, very um, almost ephemeral image to uh, image quality to the overall image. And so I, I typically either shoot thinking about that, that end result, the, the pre-visualization of that end result. So I'll, I'll shoot with multiple cameras in my bag, but not necessarily multiple lenses. Um, <clears throat> One of the first Van Dyke, or one of the first processes that I really started working with outside of traditional darkroom processes was was the Van Dyke Brown process. So uh, this is heavily based off of salted paper prints and and cyanotype style processes. So this is coating pieces of of watercolor paper with uh, photoreactive. Uh, emulsion and then exposing it to light and particularly exposing it to light on uh, with a negative in between everything and so so this is a contact printing process uh, and this is how they used to do it years and years ago during the 1800s and early uh, 1900s contact printing was the way that you you made prints for the most part you didn't use uh, enlargers or or of course digital technology either now I started working on this particularly because I had started going to graduate school School back in 2010. Uh, and the reason why I went to graduate school was because I was going uh, out to all of these mines. Uh, the abandoned mines around the Tanana Valley are, are quite plentiful, but unlike what we see in, in Independence Mine down in Anchorage or some other places like Juneau, where they've preserved a lot of the mines, the mines of the interior were not preserved at all. And I thought that that was a tragedy because I, I really link uh, our, our early mining history with a good portion of, of our, our uh, collective history as Alaskans. And so when I saw that going away, I wanted to photograph it. And unfortunately, every time that I went out to these places and photographed it with a digital camera and, and pretty traditionally with a digital camera, I didn't end up getting the right results from my audience. I had a bunch of people that would go to my exhibits and say, oh, wow, this is really cool junk. And that was about it. Uh, no one, no one connected the the necessity to save these places with with my photos. No one saw uh, the story that I saw because I was really deeply connected. Whenever I went out to these places, I felt that they were. Uh, they were still inhabited in some some small way with the spirits of the past and i really wanted to end up capturing that and traditional means of of capturing that with a digital camera just wasn't working out my audience wasn't connecting me uh, with the work and and i felt like i was failing with with telling the story of the minds and so because of that i ended up seeking out uh higher education honestly i i knew that some of my students had started surpassing the quality of work that I was doing uh, with a BA in photojournalism and I was teaching them. And not that I'm, I'm jealous of my students, but at some point you realize that uh, you should be continuing to learn if you want your students to learn. And so, so I ended up uh, pursuing an MFA through the Academy of Art University specifically to try to imbue my work with more narrative and mix that, that uh, formal element of taking a picture and capturing and, and rendering the, the remnants of these minds in, in uh, bits of silver, but also imbuing that with a story and, and involving that. And so this was an incredibly involved process uh, for, for my MFA thesis project. I was shooting on both film and digital, compositing things together because I was creating these ghost-like images of my models, which thankfully my wife and son ended up modeling for quite a few of them. And when you can't get models, you end up modeling yourself a lot as well. Uh, so I had wardrobe changes in the middle of um, Independence Mine or, or in the middle of nowhere, and it would be 30 or 40 below. Uh, and I'm doing this with models patiently waiting. Uh, and I'd, I'd drive 
300, 350 miles to get this pre-visualized shot at some place like, like Independence Mine. And then, then uh, it, don on my, my snowshoes, hike up another mile and a half and 900 feet up on the mountain just to get the shot that I want, to pack it all up and go home. And then develop my film, scan my negatives, composite things through through Photoshop, make a digital negative, coat some, some watercolor paper, and then expose that only to scan the result again so that I can upload it to my class. And so it was an incredibly involved process, but I'm not complaining. It, it gave me the connection that I needed to the art craft that I wanted to do. And so as challenging as it was to learn this process, it really ended up involving me in something in, in an amazing way. That said, you know, anything that you do in, in a grad school, you end up burning yourself out on, or at least most people do, or at least I did. And so because of that, I ended up uh, kind of switching gears afterwards. I, I started getting referred to in, in the photography uh, circles around, around Alaska as the mining guy. Uh, and at that point, I realized, okay, maybe I should diversify my, my artistic practice. And so I started working with, with a variety of different practices, and I had been going out of state to attend a, a variety of different workshops. And, and one of the workshops was run by Christina Anderson out of Montana State University, and I did it at, at uh, New Space Center for Photography in, in Portland. And we learned Morden Sage method, chemograms, and a, a, a weirdly named process called, called chromoskedastic sabatier. Uh, I really grabbed onto the, the chemograms and, and the Morden Sage method and, and kind of brought that home to Alaska as new ways that I could end up creating with my work. About the same time, I ended up having a, a family friend from Anchorage, Ann Young, contact me that her uh, to, to offer me a vintage darkroom that her mother had run in uh, Anchorage for somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 years. And she had passed away, but she had left all of this amazing stuff around. And, and uh, whenever you get a call like that, you pack up immediately and run off. And so, so I did. And I got down and it was a bunch of old paper, a bunch of old enlargers and stuff that I wasn't really excited about. Sure, I was excited about that rolly tea in the corner and a few other things. And I said, you know, okay, well, well, I'll definitely take that and I'll take that. And my friend's mom ends up leaning over to me uh, quite suspiciously and says, if you take anything, you take everything. And so I was being kind of forced into taking about two truckloads worth of stuff from, from Anchorage back to Fairbanks. And admittedly at the time, I did not appreciate everything that I had in that hold until I started getting back and realizing that now that I knew this new process, I could start playing around with all of this old antique paper. And so I grabbed this, this box of paper one day and, and it, had expired in 1945, uh, five days before the Hiroshima bombing went off. Um, and I, I had learned about the chemogram process and how you can etch in on, on a substrate that's on top of, of the paper. Uh, in this case, it's a clear lacquer that I'm using. Uh, you, you etch in patterns or words or, or uh, abstract designs. And then you alternate it, for those of you that know the dark room, between developer and fixer, developer and fixer. And eventually that lacquer wears off and you can use all kinds of different resists to end up getting ornate designs. But when I started playing with this paper, I realized that it created this beautiful rust-like pattern in it. And uh, I really gravitated toward it. I gravitated to the fact that, that the paper was, was uh, pre-Hiroshima bombing. And, and if you read some articles about what, what 
happened after the bombings and after all of the atomic tests, they actually say that that photographic paper fundamentally from a, from a chemical perspective, a molecular perspective is, is different pre uh, atomic bomb than post atomic bomb. And so I thought that was an interesting way to kind of segue into the use of this paper and then to also incorporate my interest in World War II uh, studies. One of the first things that when I was a kid and living in Germany, one of the first things that we did was actually go to the Dachau concentration camp. And so here I am nine years old going into the gas chamber at Dachau, which was never used for, for gassing anyone, but um, we go into the crematorium and you could still see bones in, in the ovens. And it was, it was disturbing and it really, it really connected to me in, in a, a certain way. And specifically, it connected to me from that historical perspective of recognizing that people didn't understand. Usually, whenever they look at something historic, they don't understand it from two perspectives. The, the, the one uh, of the victor versus the victim and understanding both of those sides really ends up giving you unparalleled access to what, what caused the things to happen. And if you've been watching the news at all in the last four to five years, you've seen a lot of disturbing elements that have a lot of shades of, of that era. And so I created these as a reminder and a reflection to really talk about all of these symbols that, that have fallen out of knowledge uh, uh, using this paper that was inextricably linked to this time to create these images. And so you see 9066, Executive Order 9066 there that interred the Japanese uh, Americans. You have the, the uh, triangle there that was, was used as a um, camp symbol to, uh, to define people of, of certain stature that was, that was in the concentration camps. You have the um, paper clips there that were actually part of the Norwegian resistance. And so I, I used these and provided, when I showed these uh, in an exhibit, provided kind of context for each of the symbols. And so again, I really like this because unlike uh, Van Dyke Brown, it forced me to kind of give away a lot of my control to the process itself. Because until this point, I, uh, until this point, I had uh, basically controlled every element in, in the process. Van Dyke Brown, I scrutinized every variable and I made sure that I really understood why I was getting the image that I was. Uh, same thing with the dark room and definitely the same thing with my digital work. But this provided kind of a handheld uh, or a handmade element. And then I had to give away a lot of my control to the process itself, which was incredibly challenging for me. But it's something that I really reveled in because it challenged my, my preconceived notions of what photography was and made it more of a conversation between what the process was giving me and what I wanted the process to do. I've always, uh, also dabbled in a variety of different alternative processes like gel medium transfers, which allow you to uh, take um, transfer tone out of, of Xeroxed images onto a gel medium, a dry gel medium surface that's then pliable and manipulatable. And I made uh, these, these weathered LED uh, light boxes out of it of, of some wintry scenes in Alaska. I've played with alternative surf, uh, surfaces for printing. In fact, these are printed directly on spray paint that has been placed on cardstock. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that your digital printers will actually print on uh, spray paint, but don't do it at school. Don't do it with a printer that you don't own. Um, it was challenging to utilize the surface, but it was kind of interesting to mask off the images and create uh, a different way of looking at, at these cross-processed images. And so you can see right now that I really like to dabble in a bunch of things and get my hands dirty and try challenging things that, that surprise me. 
Uh, and as much as I've already kind of, uh, <laughs> as much as I've already kind of um, talked about how important APC and, and, and uh, FAA is to me, I, I do wanna put another plug in there uh, because of this pro uh, project that I ended up doing, thankfully because of the geosciences department up at uh, UAF, I believe it's geosciences. Um, they have a scanning electron microscope. And of course, I'm not a scientist. I got my BA in photojournalism and my MFA in, in photography. So I have no science background, no traditional science background. But there's this amazing one credit class that they offer up at UAF called Elementary uh, Electron Scanning Microscopy. And they teach you how to utilize, how to coat samples and how to utilize a quarter million dollar machine uh, that they give you nearly free and unbridled access to for the entire semester. It's an amazing class and surprisingly all of the uh, all of the concepts that they went over, all of the, the science that you needed to understand to, to get there and to use the machine was incredibly relatable and very, very approachable. And so I ended up taking these, these images, a variety of images of spices and, and stitching them together. The, the one on the right here is a star anise. Uh, and I, I took a bunch of other ones and created uh, cyanotypes on washi or kozu paper. Very, very thin, very, very cheap kozu paper. And looking back, I really wish that I would have gotten some, some quality stock because this was the equivalent of, of printing alternative processes on toilet paper. Uh, the stuff fell apart as soon as you looked at it the wrong way. So, so it was really challenging, but I, I welcomed that challenge and I really was excited to approach it. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm starting to become known for because I talk about it so much and I'm doing a lot of research into it is lumen printing. And for those of you that have darkroom, uh, darkroom access or, or at the very least, have darkroom experience, you can do amazing things with lumen printing without a darkroom. All you need is a single chemical to make these, these images stick. You don't have to have an enlarger. You don't even have to have a dark space, uh, just a dim space to end up creating these. These are contact prints on expired photo paper. And so I'm using, again, that old photo paper that I got before from Ann Young in Anchorage. I was really, really excited excited to create in a different way. And so this is much like uh, photograms, but uh, even though this is, uh, this is black and white paper, it comes out in beautiful, beautiful color, uh, colorful shades. Um, really accessible process to get involved into. And honestly, I took it up a lot during uh, COVID because it got me out of bed. Uh, it got me making art without really spending too much time on the process. You can truly get overwhelmed by the amount of work that you have to do to end up getting there in the morning when it comes to art making. And so you put it off for another day, maybe another couple of days, and you don't end up, um, if you've read Art and Fear by David Bales and, and Ted Orland, they talk about stacking your, your deck too heavily and, and waiting until, uh, until the end of the month, maybe the end of the quarter to finally get into that creative space. And you've got so much enthusiasm to finally get in there and nothing works out. And you've put so much effort and enthusiasm into it that that failure means it, it, it hurts so much more. And so this has been a passive art making experience for me with lumens. I, I end up setting up a piece of photographic paper. I place stuff on top of it in a dim room. And then I put it outside for three to four hours. Uh, a good portion of the summer, I was uh, setting these up and then laying back in my hammock with a beer and a good book for several hours until the print was done and then I'd take it inside, scan it, then, then fix it and scan it again. 
and and you get some amazing change between uh, prefix and postfix. And and uh, I just recently taught a, a guest lecture spot at Western Washington University, where I taught this process, and none of those kids had had access to a darkroom or chemicals, and they were able to do this process and and feel creative uh, in in a completely new way, in an analog way at that. Um, one thing that I've really gotten into in the darkroom while I'm also doing this series of landscapes that I'm going to talk about next, I promise, uh, is, is the Mordensage method. And this is a, a process that I'm using with a lot of infrared film that I'm, I'm shooting. I'm, I'm shooting a, a different style of traditional black and white film that, that captures a different um, wavelength of light with the help of a red filter in front of my lens. And so what it does is it creates these, these just absolutely pitch black skies with this, uh, with an, an eruption of color from, or, or in this case, an eruption of white from uh, all of the, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the uh, foliage. And so what I've been doing with this is, is going back in the dark room, printing these traditional prints, and then utilizing a process called Mordensage to, uh, to lift the darkest areas of the image and uh, create veils out of them. It's a quite a beautiful process, an exciting process here. Uh, and, it's amazing the kind of images that come out of it. There's a lot of tedious work behind it because you're moving around these thin veils that are like uh, Polaroid transfers, if you've ever done that, but they're, even, they're almost even thinner depending on the type of Polaroid transfer you've done. And so water tension alone moves them around and manipulates them. So you've got to be extra careful. I find myself taking anywhere from one to three hours of manipulating just the veils themselves, but they come out so beautifully and wonderfully and can take these, these uh, somewhat traditional images and end up making a, a deeper uh, statement out of them by having this explosion of, of uh, the image surface itself falling apart. So nonetheless, we're not here to talk about that, but that kind of gives you a, a, a good rounded uh, explanation of who I am as a photographer and what kind of things I end up doing. Uh, and, and so I like getting my hands dirty. I love working in traditional darkroom processes or alternative processes, but I also do shoot quite a bit uh, digitally. Uh, in, in fact, back in, I believe it was about 2014, maybe 13. I think it was 14 though. Um, I finally ended up, uh, upgrading my, my digital camera. I had shot with a secondhand Canon 5D for years and I got really tired of carrying it around, honestly. Uh, I was doing shoots, um, carrying up uh, both a 5D with several lenses and then a Mamiya RZ67, which is a studio camera. And I was, uh, I was carrying that up the side of mountains uh, with a bunch of survival gear on, uh, on snowshoes and uh, I'm not the lightest person either. And so it was a lot of effort to end up carrying all of that around. And so I said, finally that, you know, okay, what kind of photographer am I? And what, what do I traditionally do with my cameras? And I researched a bunch into the Fujifilm line of cameras and realized that I didn't need more variety. I needed to limit myself more and, and tell myself the same things that I always tell my students when it comes to their, their Pentax K1000s that they're shooting with a 50 mil lens. And they complain that they can't crop their images enough to get the image that they actually want. And I always tell them to just walk up to it. You know, the, the easiest way to crop is to walk up to your subject matter. 
And so I started taking that advice myself. Although that's a lot more difficult to do when you when you start being a a landscape photographer. And and at no point, like I was alluding to before, at no point did I think that I was going to be a landscape photographer. Uh, just like Aurora photography, it's something that I leave to to everyone else in Alaska to do. It's yours. I don't really want it. Um, and it's mainly because the the uh, the field's already saturated with so many amazing people doing so much amazing things. I don't really feel like I needed to add my voice to that. Uh, although when when it came to it in 2014, I was um, this was post getting my MFA. And I was struggling to find a direction on where I was going to go with work, my work. Uh, I was getting in a rut, realizing that I was just basically packing away my camera for the winter months now because I didn't have the the day to day in and out of of classes forcing me into that routine. And so uh, I was on a trip down to visit my in laws in in Kenai. And I saw this beautiful layered composition because it was a dull day outside uh, on, on the Cook Inlet. And um, I've got a, a, a really short story to tell with a couple of these, these next few images. I've been sharing some stories on, on Instagram about how I've captured each of these. So I wanna share that with you really, really quick. Uh, this is the image that started the series. Six years ago, while heading back from Homer and driving on K Beach Road, I saw this shot and initially hesitated on wasting time taking the shot. At the time, I wasn't a landscape photographer, nor did I want to be. My wife, Deanna Lazarus, which is here tonight, however, encouraged me to get out and try something new. I had already seen the shot. I had already lined it up. I had already known what it would look like on the back of my camera, but I still hesitated. Were it not for that gentle push, I wouldn't have started a shoot, uh, shooting a series that has served as therapy at times and has made me fall back in love with the state that I call home. I was in a bad rut when, when I got done with my MFA. I think that I thought immediately I would be moving to the lower 48 for a tenure track position at some prestigious university. And of course that didn't immediately happen. Uh, and so because of that, I started resenting a lot of Alaska. I, I had gotten tired of the winters. It's really easy to in Fairbanks with, with as much cold and dark as we have up here. And so I, I ended up getting really, really frustrated by the whole thing. And because of that, I really started falling out of love with Alaska, uh, something that I had had an affair with for, for quite a while. Um, I, I had loved Alaska, especially the summers. It's really hard to love it during the winters, but uh, I needed to do something to get out there to reframe everything that I was doing with Alaska. And so, um, this ended up being that project. And, and what I wanted to do was focus on specifically the layers, uh, make, make each of the images more a conversation about the layers and the formal elements and the formal relations between each of those elements. I wanted to shoot in, in lighting that I generally tell my students to avoid that, that completely dull, listless, dead light that you get in, in the middle of winter because this is the Alaska that I love. You know, this is the Alaska that I'm so used to seeing because I see it so often. This is Alaska that we all, as Alaskans, for those of you that are, uh, this is the stuff that makes us stay. It's not those beautiful, perfect images that we see from, from uh, Ansel Adams or, or something on a perfect bucolic kind of countryside road. It is those, those quiet, silent moments in the middle of winter when you can hear yourself think uh, there's, there's not a single noise and, and, it, and it's just beauty and silent and calm and, and strength kind of personified in, in, the, uh, in the landscape. So this is one of my favorite early images that I 
ended up taking. And uh, I've got a really short statement on this one too. It's hard reframing the familiar to be noteworthy, particularly the lonely six hour long stretch of road that separates Fairbanks from Alaska's largest city, Anchorage. I've driven the Parks Highway likely more than 50 times over the last 20 years, and I can nearly cite the mileage marker with each turn of the road, much to the chagrin of my wife. Making it beautiful was a hurdle that I had to stumble over. It took Mother Nature reworking it for me to take notice. The 2015 Sockeye Fire devastated the wide community of Willow, destroying hundreds of homes and structures, displacing in many mushers and families. Tensions were still understandable, understandably raw months later when I took this shot, horns blaring at me even when I was well off of the road. Likely they pursued, uh, presumed that I intended to exploit their pain for profit, making ruin porn, as I like to call it, out of their dis disrupted lives. But I intentionally stay, stayed well away from the homes. I had no intention of making light of their pain. I only wanted to capture Mother Nature's ability to transform and yet still show strength and beauty much like the Alaskans that rose from the ashes of their homes to rebuild their lives. And that's what this series started becoming was more an expression of, of Alaskans in the landscape and seeing Alaskan attitude and Alaskan uh, strength and resilience and resolve and stubbornness in the, the landscapes that I was creating with this. These, these are uh, fragile ecosystems and environments that I'm, I'm photographing in, and yet somehow they still come back to life every year. <clears throat> I played with that idea of abstraction and, and focusing on texture and other formal elements and just rendering those. And, and particularly, I, I chose the, the square format because it really, it, in my mind, it really focuses that element on, on uh, it focuses the frame on formal elements. Once you stretch it out one way or another, you're expecting either a landscape or a portrait. And this is somewhere in between those two. Uh, it ends up being a representation of Alaskans people by their resolve and, and kind of a, a, a visual representation of all of those positive attributes that we associate to Alaskans when we talk about why Alaskans are strong uh, and why they're resilient. But it's also that, that uh, visual representation of, of Alaska's beauty, maybe not at its prime, but still it's silent beauty, that, that, that beauty that, that transcends a uh, perfectly lit day uh, and really shows its resilience. So since the beginning, the series has intended to show not only uh, show Alaska not at its ordinary prime, but to find those spaces that show a rarefied Alaska in ways that only an Alaskan could love. After a year or two of shooting these images, I soon realized that these landscapes, always shot square, were more portraits than landscapes, and that they acted as stand-ins for Alaskan archetypes. In fact, each stark windswept scene photographed showed the isolation, resilience, strength, all of those things that define Alaskans. This made photographing even more challenging as now those captured scenes not only needed to be formally sim uh, similar, but also character defining. I find sourdoughs in this empty wild and I find their drive to persevere in the way the sun weakly illuminates a whitewashed landscape that always comes back in bloom each spring, defying the elements. <clears throat> so much of interior Alaska is covered with black spruce trees made to look emaciated and fragile 
by the permafrost that slows their growth to a glacial place. It's hard finding traditionally inspiring vistas in such a setting, uh, setting. And it stumped me for years and made me dislike my home for the lack of traditional beauty for a long time. In fact, for years, I actually told people that they had to leave Fairbanks by about 100 miles in any direction to find a good landscape. Um, I was arrogant like that for a long time. This series ended up changing that. It took me a long time to realize that Alaska isn't a traditional beauty. It's one defined much like its people by the qualities with much greater depth than skin deep beauty. These spindly trees listing at haphazard angles and rooted in uneven muskeg show resolve, strength, determination, perseverance, fortitude, courage, bravery, and well, even maybe a dash of thick headedness and stubbornness, and per perhaps even a headstrong iron willed come hell or high water attitude that gets it through each damnable, frigid, arctic winter. If Alaskans aren't beautiful for the exact same reason, then you don't know an Alaskan. And so again, each of these are shot with, with a uh, camera that does not allow me to change the lens. So each image is shot at 23 millimeter. It was shot with two different generations of Fuji X100 uh, cameras. And uh, it forces me to walk until uh, the, the image works. And most of these are directly off of the road. I spend a lot of time during the winter driving, say, 700 miles uh, to take a shot or two. Sometimes, though, I get really lucky. Uh, and then this next series of images actually ends up coming from a, a series of shots that I shot during an uh, a trip with a fellow photographer, a fellow Fairbanks photographer named Artem Zhdanov. And um, this was an opportunity for me to see how Artem shoots and for him to see the same thing about me. And I think that it's one thing that I, I would deeply encourage all, all photographers to end up doing, no matter how old you are, really get to know your, your friends that are photographers and uh, go out and see how they photograph without commenting, walk around, see what they see, see how they see, and, and uh, not emulate it, but put it in storage for the next time. Have conversations and deep conversations about how each of you end up surveying the scene until you find an image that works. And so each of these were, uh, were photographed during that really, really productive trip in February of 2019 with, with Artem. Uh, and we both came back with a lot of uh, very interesting revelations about uh, each other's work. Uh, we, we pushed each other as well. There were a lot of times that I didn't wanna get out of the car and uh, Artem was, was jumping into snow drifts just to end up getting the shot. Uh, similarly, he didn't, uh, there were multiple times when he didn't see what I saw at all uh, until I got out of the car and, and crawled on the ground or, or looked down rather than looking up. And so I see a, a harmony in these images, a, a, a simplicity to them that focuses on those beautiful formal elements that sometimes we might miss if we're not looking down or if we're not taking time. And often I tell my students, uh, whether they're digital photographers or film photographers, that you can only take so many images. At, at a certain point, you really need to take the camera down, put it around your neck and, and fall in love with what you just photographed. Um, connect with that environment and remember it and, and place it into your long-term memory. There are a bunch of studies that come out because uh, uh, recently because of, of smart 
smartphones that talk about the fact that that now that we go on vacation with smartphones and always have devices taking images, that we're actually starting to uh, fail to build up memories anymore. And what we end up remembering is, is the pictures that we took and not the memories themselves. And a lot of that comes from this idea that we're constantly behind the camera. And so a lot of the way that, that I work, whether, whether I'm, not, I'm in the middle of an old mine or in the middle of a, a, of a snowy landscape is, is I take time to, to really appreciate what, what I've got. I, I consider the scene. I won't even take shots sometimes for 20, 30, 40 minutes as I look around, move things around. Particularly with this landscape uh, series, I didn't want any signs of man. In, in it. So you won't find a house, you won't find a boat, you won't find a trail of, of uh, snowshoes in, in any of the shots. They haven't been edited out, that's how they were captured. In fact, all of these images for the most part are, are very, very uh, limited on the editing. It generally ends up being curves and, and maybe a spot or two here or there that I take out. But for the most part, it's curves, some slight saturation just to get it to kind of a, a photojournalist edit of the scene that I photographed. And so I'm not going um, full tilt on Photoshop to make any of these images. So one thing that, that this image in particular I keep on coming back to is, is that idea of, of looking differently. We always tell, as, as instructors, we always tell our, our novice photographers, our, our new photographers, that they need to look differently, that they need to roll on the ground, that they need to climb upstairs and, and find a new perspective to make their images more interesting. Uh, but we don't always follow our own uh, advice as photographers. And so photographers are often gazing off in the distant, always attempting to frame the world around them in rectangles and squares that balance, direct the eye, tell the, uh, a story or capture an emotion. While I'd never call this series a traditional set of landscapes, I did find myself often ignoring some of the closest details when I photographed. My eyes were always set towards some far off point in the distance, looking for a way to harmonize the tensions in each composition. It wasn't until recently that I noticed how much I was missing because my eyes were always locked on the horizon. Looking down opened up so many new possibilities. Resilience hasn't always, it hasn't ever been about traditional landscapes. It's more of a love poem about Alaska for Alaskans. It does so in taking portraits in its unique spaces, including those that exist under our feet, often ignored. So I included this shot, even though this isn't a shot in my series. Number one, because my wife is here. And number two, because we need to talk about how important it is that uh, we receive the critique that we need uh, to, to build on a series. Uh, I run a local photography group here called Photography Untapped, and I utilize it on a normal basis when COVID's not happening to uh, get feedback on my images. And generally, because I've set up this group, generally there's a couple newcomers that tend to be a little cautious about the idea of telling a college instructor uh, whether or not his images are good. In fact, a lot of my prior students end up starting to show up to this because they recognize how important it is to end up getting critique. Critique's incredibly hard to get in the art world. You can always get a gallery curator to tell you what they think, but when it comes to a fellow photographer, they're likely going to pat you on the back and make you feel better. Uh, your mom or dad or your family or your significant other usually, usually ends up doing the same thing. And so when I was driving back in November 2018 down to Anchorage to deliver my chemograms for an exhibit that I had in Alaska Pacific, uh, I was looking through the landscapes in a new way, hoping to end up finding something for this series during the 700 mile round trip, just to drop off my, my show, attend my, my first Friday, and then drive back up. 
uh, up uh, north. South of Hurricane Gulch, I found the lingering remnants of an ice jam that had created a fragile shelf of ice high on the trees. Pulling off the road, I spent a, a while struggling to compose a shot in that jumbled mess of beige landscape devoid of its typical snow. Eventually, I eked out a single usable image of it featuring a delicate uh, ice shelf teetering on a freshly chewed beaver snack. I was convinced that I had the shot. Once I got back to Fairbanks, I pitched the image to my local photography group. Uh, and uniformly, my peers convinced me that the shot failed to meet my bar uh, because of the snowless landscape. I admitted that they were right, and it just didn't fit in the series. And so this image ends up getting uh, kind of put into a pile of, of uh, failures at that point, or at least ones that didn't work with the series. So late in December of that year, I made the same trek. Uh, to pick up my series of chemograms at, at Alaska Pacific again. And passing through Hurricane Gulch again, I, surprise, surprise, found the same scene again, but this time with snow. So I was convinced that I had the shot at this point. Uh, I was overjoyed, uh, ended, in, ended up thinking that I had it in the bag. I, I returned to my, my photography group and everyone was excited about this new shot, said I had it in the bag. Uh, so I got home from, from uh, my photo group and I ended up showing it to my wife, Deanna. She's a, she's a fellow artist and, and my absolute confidant. Uh, I was sure that she'd be elated. What I got wasn't the reaction that I was expecting. Uh, she looked at it and, and started walking away and said, oh, yeah, 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 that's, that's cool. I looked at her and I said, what, wait, wait, no, no. You're holding back, tell me. No, um, uh, no, no, it's, it's great, it's real cool. No, tell me what you really think, I mean it. She sighs, I mean it, I can take it. After all, I teach photography and she just belts out. I hate it, I don't like it at all, you can do better. I'm kind of stunned by this. My wife just said that she hates her work. She usually ends up kind of sugarcoating this a lot more. And so I'm really surprised that she's as blunt as she is. And, and so I say, wow, hate, really? I mean, are you looking at the same image? Uh, yeah, I don't like it at all. I don't know. It's just not good. You can do better. Um, you know, usually at this point, if anyone else said it, I'd be critiquing them for having an inarticulate uh, critique of it because they're not talking about the formal elements and they're not giving me a way to make it better. But but if she hates it that much that she's not using articulate terms of, of critique, know that I need to revisit it. So I put it on the discard pile and I really start considering whether or not I should put it there. Maybe she's just wrong. Um, but I put it on this discard pile and say, okay, fine, it won't work in the series. So I flash forward to, to February of 2019. And I'm still looking around for this nebulous better that my wife was talking about uh, that she was convinced that I could find. I'm heading home from an outstanding photography adventure in, in Valdez or to Valdez with Artem uh, as we pass Gokana. I see it on the side of the road. And for the last two days, however, our Tim and I have been bouncing back and forth with this, this presumed awkwardness. One person is always worried about the other one asking to stop and taking too many photos. And I'm pretty sure that at this point I've made my quota. I've stopped on the side of the road in this times. I don't need to stop anymore. I've got a half dozen good images in the back. There's no reason to stop. And then it starts itching it starts bothering me and it starts eating at me as I put a mile, maybe a, a two miles between me and the shot. And I eventually profusely apologize to him, turn around as fast as I can. And I hike out in the deep, uh, deep snow to a roadside pond that had frozen thick with six inches of iridescently blue green ice. And I take this image. The warm weather that we had recently had had undammed the lake, 
vacating the water below the ice. As the water rushed out, the ice grew so heavy in the middle that most of it shattered into the crater of the now absent lake, leaving a ring around the pond where captive conifers, trees, and grass lay inside the overflow ice upon its edges. Eventually, I found the shot in the absent lake with Artem. I brought it home and, uh, and Deanna was finally happy, finally, with the shot that I took, a shot, uh, a shot that I would have never taken were it not for my overwhelming stubbornness and her brute force honesty. If I didn't get uh, that critique, I would have never done better. I would have never aspired to, be, to do better because I think I thought that I had it in the bag back here. Uh, and, and the funny thing is, is that I owe so much of my creative success on her continued support of me and my own special brand of craziness. She pushes me more than the toughest critics do. Were it not for her, I'd never have captured this image that now defines my series of work. Were it not for her, I wouldn't have had the shot that confounds literally dozens of gallery viewers. And I wouldn't joyfully have to explain that the photo is neither a, compo a composite of individual photos or some arcane digital alchemy. Straight photography at its best, I found the shot that other photographers regret passing themselves because they never saw it ever again. And here the universe gives it to me three times in six months. So this image in, was the image that ended up winning best of show in, in 2019 at Rarified, and it continues to be a, a favorite. In fact, I just found out today that I've already sold three copies of it at my gallery show. So uh, pretty, pretty impressed by that, that number myself. This was another image that kind of confound, uh, confounded people. And in fact, it was, it was in uh, Rarified Light 2019 as well. I, I loved this one because I got some interesting, really funny feedback off of it from not only the gallery docents, but also uh, when I got the box back from Alaska uh, Photographic Center. Um, when I talked to the docents, they told me that they have real trouble with this image because every time that someone uh, looks at it, they think that it's an empty frame. And because they think it's an empty frame, uh, they let the docent know that uh, they've hung incorrectly an image with no photograph in it. Uh, on the other hand, because the people packing the show for APC apparently had similar issues with it, they actually wrote on the plastic sleeve that they put it in white out so that people wouldn't question whether or not there was an image there. So when I photographed this with Artem, it was, it was uh, near white out conditions. Uh, at, at Summit Lake on Richardson Highway. And I slammed on the brakes, which is probably not a great thing to do in February. I turned around, went to the side of the road right at, at uh, Summit Lake. And Ed Artem's looking at me like I'm a crazy person. There's nothing out there to photograph. In fact, I'm fairly certain that he said that multiple times as we got out of the car and he had to follow me because he didn't trust that I was all right in the head, I think, uh, as I saw this shot. And we went to the shore, the edge of the, the lake, and uh, I pointed out this simple single line of light gray that, that uh, transversed the entire uh, horizon. And uh, he, of course, like any good friend, started making fun, uh, fun of me for the next couple of months about the fact that this was going to be the shot that I was going to be known for, the line shot. Uh, and subsequently ended up uh, writing on my dry, uh, my dry erase board at work multiple times, the line and the line photographer to tease me about it. But uh, a lot of people either really hate this image me really hate this image or really like it as well. In fact, I got a coworker here, Jamie Smith, which, which teaches, uh, I believe, drawing and comic book art at, at UAF for the art department. Um, 
ended up bringing his his class around to to my show and they pretty much uniformly said that they hated this image which is funny um but but it's that kind of critique that that you need to move a a series along because i also got to hear what they fought over which images they liked more and so so it was a really good amount of feedback that i needed to hear now i've started kind of stepping back from the composition as I get into the fourth and fifth year of, of doing this series, because I know that there, there's a need for variety to keep this series fresh and to make it work as I carry it, it along as, as we go further here. And so uh, I start looking for, for mountains and larger vistas that actually create either a sense of formal relationship or uh, or talk about that isolation, that strength, that resolve, that resilience, that stubbornness. Uh, in this one, I just, I loved the formal relationship of having, having the, the shape of the mountain echoed in, in this very elegant uh, island of ice in the middle of the Matanuska. Sometimes uh, formal elements kind of fall uh, to the wayside and it's just, just general beauty during, during these simple uh, kind of moments. You know, this doesn't have the formal balance of the other images, but the color just really drew me to this, this particular uh, composition. I ended up intentionally cropping it this way because of course, anyone that knows the Kenai Lake, there's houses on it. And I really wanted this to be more about a, a series, more about the, the conversation that I was having with just Mother Nature rather than anything else. I really love the Elliott Highway. I keep on going up there quite often to end up getting these, these uh, sorts of shots. Um, it's so isolated and and it's not busy and I can sit on the side of the road for 20 or 30 minutes and not have a single car come, come along. Uh, I, I never was a person for this kind of abstract uh, minimalism until I really started photographing this, this series because this resembles so much of Alaska and there's some kind of simplistic beauty to it all that that is hard to put hard to quantify in in traditional terms. It's also scenes like this that show that weight and burden of of winter after winter distorting the the shapes of of our trees and of our landscape just by simple weight just by the 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 pain and the frustration and the hurt and the suffering that these elements or these, these uh, natural elements go through during the elements, uh, during winter. And I can't help but think about how winter impacts all Alaskans and how uh, seasonal affective disorder is so, so prevalent up here, how uh, I often, as an instructor, have to explain to students why their mood is altering and changing and they're, they're struggling by this time of the year because they don't get the same amount of light because they're not active as much. And, and it's incredibly uh, trying and depressing for so many people. And, and our statistics from a, uh, discussing suicide and, and depression are, are just staggering in this state. Um, and so there's, there's some, it, it helps to be able to relate the, the landscape to this. And, and particularly with this, uh, this own, uh, this one image, I look at this and I look at other images that I've taken for the series and realize that this series in of itself has become a, a mental health project for me as well. Uh, it not only allowed me to, uh, kind of rekindle uh, an appreciation and a love for Alaska, but it also made me work through a lot of stuff. Uh, driving 700 miles by yourself in the middle of winter uh, with no one else in the car, um, nothing on the radio gives you that 
contemplative space that uh, our busy digital lives might not allow us to do anymore. And it allowed me to settle a lot of stuff. And by f spending six to eight months every year reframing a, a difficult landscape into beauty made me realize that I was actually starting to look forward to winters and the dark and the cold. And because it meant that I, I had an opportunity to be creative in ways that I couldn't during the summer. And so I don't see there being a stopping point for this series as I go forward, because this has, has been incredibly cathartic and incredibly helpful. Uh, mentally for me and uh it's it's really risen me up and i've fallen back in love deeper with with alaska than i ever was before i even find myself uh photographing all the way into may and september for this i i didn't include it here but i i recently shot uh in the on I think Labor Day weekend or maybe the weekend after that off of Paxson Lake, some uh, some fog that would fit perfectly into the series. But uh, even up until May, you're finding these spaces where, where the, the story that the landscape tells is muted because of, of that connection with winter. If it wasn't for the the uh, snow, our eyes would be so much busier and we wouldn't be able to see uh, the gentle shapes that 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 interaction between snow and form end up creating. This one particular reminds me a lot of Elliot Porter's work or maybe Bev Doolittle's work. And so I find myself almost lured to these more isolated stretches of road more and more. And I find myself uh, spending a lot more time in the winter um, accessing these spaces. I find myself in the landscape as much as I find those, those near and dear to my, myself, uh, those Alaskans that I, I revere for, for their, uh, their resilient nature. For those of you that may have been uh, may have been accustomed to this body of work, may have seen it uh, displayed before, perhaps at at uh, Alaska Pacific University or in other galleries. I I used to end up calling the the series Skookum, uh, and anyone that knows the the difficult language history with Skookum probably knows not only why I used the word, but also why I stopped using the word. Uh, I, I really gravitated toward the idea of this series being represented by the word Skookum because as you look through through the writings of both John Muir and, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm spacing on, on authors at this point, but um, you look at, at other writers during the time, like, like, uh, Jack London, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Jack London and John Muir, they talk about Skookum and they use it in such a broad defined term and talk about how it's strength and resilience and courage and beauty and, and, and resolve and, and resilience and all of those things that end up adequately, not just adequately, but perfectly defining Alaskans. I've seen people use it as a general affirmation as well. Uh, when it came to the, the conference that I was in charge of this last uh, September, um, I ended up presenting the work there actually uh, as, as a short form uh, element. And um, when I when I showed the work, I called it Skookum there, and I ended up having a, a photographer that I didn't really know at the time come up to me, uh, which was uh, Stephen Zagleski, and um, he unfortunately recently passed this summer, uh, but he pulled me aside and very very gingerly, very very. Uh, respectfully asked me why I was using a word that had a lot of derogatory roots that I didn't know about. 
And I was shocked uh, because the conference that I was holding was actually all about the idea of cultural exchange. And no one had pointed this out to me until then. And in fact, everyone had always used the term around me as a, as a positive affirmation. And so I was really troubled and started seeking out uh, uh, indigenous leaders in in, Fair, in the Fairbanks area and in indigenous uh, educators and asking them about this this name and uh, eventually I ended up getting some feedback and, and they told me yeah you really shouldn't use that name uh, it it's always been used derogatorily around me uh, to to refer to um, elders in a negative way, and that was not what I signed up for. Um, I had a lot of good arguments with people on, on the use of this name and where, where I should or shouldn't be. I had a lot of friends uh, that, that suggested that I should keep on using the name because that wasn't what I intended it, the name to be. And, and when you're using harmful names, it's not a matter of whether or, whether or not your heart is in the right place. It's whether or not you're hurting someone with the use of that word. And so uh, very uh, recently, in fact, at the beginning of the year, I ended up shifting over to the word resilient. I don't think that there's a word in the English language that manages to uh, kind of combined all of the elements that, that I wanted that word to define the series to be, but resilience is, is a term that's, that's near and dear to my heart and very, very close to what I, I want this, this series to resemble. And so uh, you can see that I start shifting early in, in 2020 to these more uh, ghost-like figures of, of, uh, of landscapes, pulling my camera back more and more and changing how I formally uh, compose these images and how I, I converse with the landscape in a different way. Once again, showing the awe of Alaska and the simplicity in this, this awe. It is not a perfect day. It's not uh, in Ansel Adams' exposure. What it is, is, is what we have to, as Alaskans, live with. This is our day-to-day -day Alaska, and this is what we stay here for. This is the beauty, the simplistic beauty that really, uh, really creates a conversation between us and our landscape and, and makes us call these places home. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So I managed to wrap that up perfectly. I'm pretty happy about that. That was an hour and a half right on the nose. Um, I want to thank everyone for showing up tonight uh, and and taking time to listen to everything that I have here. I want to uh, also encourage all of you to, if you're in the Fairbanks area, to drop by the uh, exhibit from 12 to 6 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, it's available on the third floor of the Centennial Center for the Arts. Just to let you know, because of COVID season, they've changed where you access the building from. So you're accessing on the north side of the building rather than the south side of the building. And they are uh, promoting COVID safety. So masks are required. The only reason why I don't have one on is because they're closed at this point. Uh, so masks are required and uh, social distancing is required as well. But this is a, a great opportunity to, to get out in a safe environment because it's nice and spread out to end up seeing some art. Uh, and it's not nearly as crowded as say a first Friday would be. So um, I wanna thank you and leave, leave uh, a few minutes here for questions. I've got my website there and my, my Instagram, my Facebook, and I use Ello as a social media platform as well. So thank you again. Any questions? Thanks a lot, Jason. Um, do, do you shoot, does your camera allow you to set that square format in, cam in camera or are you uh, cropping? 
Sure. So I, I actually said it in camera. Uh, and, and so even though I do show, shoot dual RAW and JPEG, so RAW does not crop the image, uh, I typically end up doing very minimal edits with my images to the point where, where I'm connecting via Wi-Fi to my, my phone and editing generally in Snapchat, or not Snapchat, oh God, no not Snapchat, uh, <laughs> Snapseed, Snapseed on uh, my iPhone. And then I upload it and I'm pretty happy with the images after that, that uh, relationship. I don't end up doing a bunch of edits on it. Generally, it's less than five to 10 minutes of, of editing and I'm pretty happy with it and ready to print it actually. Cool. Hey, I'll jump in. Can you hear sure. me? Yep. Yeah, great, great presentation, Jason. And uh, thank you. Comment is is less about photography and more about typography. I I really like this the type setting of the word resilient that was showing in the upper left there. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna guess it was Optima uh, or similar uh, to Optima. It is Marcellus. Ah, okay, similar to Optima. <laughs> um. And what I, what I, when I looked at that and, it, and in, in um, proximity to your images was the word silent kept uh, kind of creeping up on yeah. me. And uh, I even Googled resilient uh, versus silent to see if there was any relationship. I didn't find anything. But um, anyway, yeah, a lot of your images kind of had a silence to them that you know, we find in the, in the extreme cold and the, and the remote. Uh, landscapes. Thank and you. So the, the very low horizon line that you've given a lot of your images, you know, you, you kind of, um, I don't know, for some, somehow that sort of adds to that silence. So, um, yeah, strong, I think, that they're silence, cool. I think. Your, your images are strong in silence. So, thank you. Uh, I, I think that that silence ends up being an element of solace for me and probably many Alaskans. Uh, uh, you know, as soon as we have that first snowfall uh, in, in Fairbanks, immediately the decibel level of, of your, your neighborhood goes down uh, just, just amazingly. You can go outside in the middle of not, uh, the night and you can, you can hear absolutely nothing. And, and that that's, can be disturbing at times, but I think that when, when I've been photographing this, it's, it's provided me with a lot of calm and, and cured a lot of problems that I have with anxiety and, and uh, uh, being frightened, especially during this time. You know, it's, it's nice to find some, something that gives you solace. So Jason, can you talk about the difference between your hands-on work that you've been known for and, and this work, which is very distant, very cool, very, and I, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but very flat in a certain sense. And um, what are your feelings about dealing with those two very different fields? Yeah, I, gosh, that's a really good question, Richard. Um, and I don't know if I'll be able to actually answer it to, to satisfaction, um, but I, I wanted to frame, if I was going to do landscapes, I wanted to frame it in a way that I knew that before I even got out of the car, before I, I uh, slammed on the brakes. I knew that I had an image in the bag that works for the series. You know, even even though uh, I talk a lot about that one image on on the ice slice and reshooting it and reshooting it and finding it and and making it work and manipulating, uh, not really manipulating, but just reshooting it. Uh, for the most part, these are these are one-offs. I don't have a huge pile of discards here because when when I stop, when I hit the brakes, I already know that I I have this flattened atmosphere. If if the sun's showing, I don't even open up my camera back uh, because I need that flatness 
to really layer this compos these compositions. I wanted most of them to kind of resemble a layer cake uh, experience that that almost personifies the the silence. So when you see depth, there's a lot of noise there. Your eyes going all over the place. When you end up um, placing something in a in a square frame, it quiets down the composition. When you flatten things by using flattening light or or deep depth of field, it quiets the composition. And when you really focus on just the formal resolution between different layers uh, and creating that that layering effect, it quiets the composition even more. And so so it's I, I feel it's very cool and 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 calming looking at this work. And I think, the reason why I've put so much restriction on how I shoot this and when I shoot these images is in direct relation to the fact that I, I normally involve myself tactile with my work, uh, physically with my work, getting in there in the dark room, touching my work, literally making the photo paper that I'm making. And so I've had to limit and narrow myself and, and, and kind of, not see it as a crutch, but see it as an opportunity to truly create something that that is challenging. And and so by by forcing myself to use a 23 millimeter lens for landscape, which is normally not a landscape lens, uh, to to force myself into one set composition that adds the challenge that that is kind of echoed in the dark room. <coughs> when I create something uh, handmade. So I think that's, I think that answers your question. <laughs> um, I, well, I think it does. I mean, because this work is almost anti-tactile. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's just very different to see those different bodies of work coming out of the same eyeball. Thank you. So Ellen Davis says, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation and loved your, uh, love your work. I feel inspired to do more lumen printing. I really think that everyone that's a photographer should do lumen printing. I think that cameraless photographic processes are outstanding. And if you're not already uh, an artist that jumps between different artistic disciplines, that will encourage it. Uh, when I started doing alternative process and particularly the, the historical processes like, like cyanotype and Van Dyke Brown and salted paper prints and albumin, um, I ended up relating so much more to what my wife was doing as a printmaker. We could have discussions about these things. And of course, Richards introduced me to the idea of solar plates and, and he's piqued my interest on that. And, and that's kind of that, that meshing of all these different processes together. And, and lumen printing is so rewarding because you feel like you're accomplishing something with, with little effort and and understand that my my compositions that I do with with lumen prints tends to be a lot more complicated than most people do because I'm multiple layers I've got I've got cutouts I, I'm really trying to challenge myself with that in fact the last set of lumens that I did took five days to expose uh, because there's no sun in Fairbanks right now practically um, and, and that's been really exciting to, to know that at the end of the week, I'll have created something with just really taking it outside each morning. And that's pretty much it. Um, really, really great work uh, to, to get involved in is that passive art making, those things that will make you feel good without you really having to work too hard. So Jesse says that it's not a square image, but the current image you have up uh, 
of the extra wide willow fire really provides the viewer with the sense that it's going, uh, it's ongoing and even possibly inescapable. I love it. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, I I really love this image and and the image that I have of the maze of of cottonwoods. Um, in let's see if I can't bring it up here really quick. Uh, the maze of cottonwoods down in in Black Rapids here. Gotta move things around so that you can see it. And so I've got kind of the same thing going here, but I started kind of moving away from trees, mainly because there's only so many images that you can take of trees. Although Elliot Porter kind of defies that logic. Um, that said, uh, I've, I've been trying to challenge myself in different directions with all of these images. One of the ones that, that I didn't show tonight that, that still confounds me and I don't know whether or not it fits is this one. Um, I really like the image, but it's starting to get a little too colorful compared to, to uh, the other images that I've shot. And, and uh, in fact, a lot of people have been, um, I use social media quite a bit, have been uh, sharing these images in black and white forums. Uh, and, and they're not black and white, they're, they're color images. The colors just, just totally mute it. So I am trying to like stretch out those those pitifully narrow horizons and find new ways to to access all of this information. Other questions? Yeah, I want to thank all of you for, for showing up tonight. I really appreciate it. Feel free if you do have questions to connect with me on either my website, uh, through Facebook, Instagram, or Ello. I'd be more than happy to ask, uh, answer any questions that you might have about the series. Uh, if you're Fairbanks based, definitely drop by the gallery. Uh, help out APC and, and, and FAA there. Uh, make sure that you contribute to to them as you you value these things that both APC and, and FAA brings you. So thank you again for for spending your evening with me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Great job. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. It's great. Jason, thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Bye all. <laughs>